Okay. Well, good morning. It's a privilege to be able to speak this morning, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to be preaching out of Colossians, uh, Colossians 3. Colossians is one of those, like, small books that just seems hard to find, you know? <laughs> Romans, uh, Corinthians, all those little books. If you're having trouble finding it, let me tell you, there's an index in the beginning of your Bible. You can find what page it is. Uh, let me begin by this question. What is the most difficult thing in the world to do? What's the most difficult? Think about it a moment. What's the most difficult thing in the world to do? You know, maybe, maybe it's like climbing uh, Mount Everest. You know, many Many people die every year trying to climb Mount Everest or on the way down. It's, it's just, it's very, very dangerous. Or, or I actually Googled this, this question a little bit, and here's what some people said. Some people said the hardest thing to do in the world is speaking a foreign language. How about dealing with the death of a loved one? That, that's hard. How about parenting? Parenting's hard, yeah. Overcoming addiction. Yeah, I, I can see that. How about to uh, compete as an Olympic athlete or a professional athlete? Yeah, that's, that's something I could never do. <laughs> well, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson asked this question, what's the hardest task in the world? And here's what he said. He said his answer was to think. But, you know, he was a philosopher, so maybe he just thought that his task was the most difficult thing in the world to do. <laughs> we all tend to kind of think that at times we are going through the most difficult thing in the world to do. And, you know, some of you have gone through very difficult things at, the, at, at, at different times. But I think, I think um, there's one thing that's far more difficult than all of these things, and that is to love. Putting on love is more difficult than all of these things. Putting on love, I think, is the most difficult thing in all of life. It sounds easier than it is. To, to love God and to love others every day, every hour, every minute, this is an impossible task, and yet we are called to do this difficult task of love. Well, before I read, let me... Let me pray for us, and uh, let me pray for Dave as well uh, as he's recovering. <clears throat> Father, we, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we lift up uh, Dave Magoon, our, our brother, Lord. Um, pray that uh, he would be healed, Lord, that, that uh, you would bring restoration to his body, Lord, that you bring comfort to him this morning as he's missing out on, uh, on being here present with us this morning. Uh, and Lord, I just thank you for the many ways that he is serving this church. And uh, when he's not present, his, his, uh, he's missed greatly, Lord. So I pray, Lord, uh, bring uh, restoration to his body. Heal him, Lord, even supernaturally, Lord. Uh, pray that you would bring healing to his body. And Lord, I pray for our uh, understanding of your word this morning as we delve into it, as we look at it, Lord, help us to receive it as your holy word, the words that you spoke and the words that you speak to us now. Give us your Holy Spirit that we would be able to put on love, that we would be able to reflect what you're like. And so I pray, Lord, open our ears, even me, Lord, I need this message too, so that you change our hearts and soften our hearts to be able to love this morning, this week, that we would become love like you are love. Praise in Jesus' name, amen. So as I mentioned, you know, love... Um, love's not just something that we do, right? It's not just a task, uh, although it certainly involves actions, you know, um, but uh, love should be in you uh, and bring it to everything that you do. Love, love, you could think of it 
sort of like, you know, you put something on like a t-shirt, but love is the thing, is the kind of thing that we, we don't take it off, right? A t-shirt now she only goes so far because when you wear a t-shirt, you know, it gets dirty and you have to change it and wash it, but love, love never gets dirty. You never have to take it off. And as you put on love, it becomes a part of you. You never run out of love. And, and here's what I would like us to, to focus on this morning, is that as Christians, we must not only love God and others, but also have a heart of love. That's my, my main theme, how I would summarize this passage, especially verse 14. As Christians, we must not only love God and others, but also have a heart of love. And so I'm going to ask just three questions this morning, and I want you to pay attention to the answers, but here are the questions. What is love? Why must we love? And how can we love? It's pretty simple questions. What is love? Why must we love? And how can we love? And like I said, I want you to pay attention to the answers. Let's start with the first one. What is love? You know, lots of people have all kinds of opinion on what love is. Um, It's not a a dance song written by Hathaway or a song by Keisha Cole or Frank Sinatra. (laughs) Have have you heard of this one? Um, (laughs) Love means never having to say you're sorry. I think is rightly criticized as one of the dumbest understandings of love that I've heard. (laughs) Uh, The dictionary says that love is an intense feeling of deep affection. Okay? I I think a lot of people think of love as simply an an emotion, like as a feeling. And there's certainly lots of aspects of feeling in love, right? But is, is that what Scripture is telling us to do, have strong feelings of affection for people? I, I mean, certainly that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> but when we're called to, to put on love, it's, it's more than that, right? If you've been to a wedding, you've probably heard 1 Corinthians 13 recited. Love is patient, love is kind. And the, you know, the bride and groom stare deeply into each other's eyes, and they have strong feelings of affection for each other. They're lost in the clouds when the scripture is read. They're probably not even paying attention. (laughs) But as as Jeff mentioned last week, right, 1 Corinthians 13 isn't isn't directed as a tone of kind of lovey-dovey or romantic affection. The Apostle Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13 to a church body, right? And it's actually as a correction and as a warning. It's totally appropriate to, to read it at a wedding because we want to love like we're told to love, but let me, let me just read it. I should have probably opened this before I, I uh, started preaching. But 1 Corinthians 13 should sound, well, I don't know how Paul meant it, but this is, how I, this, this is my attempt at it. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says this, Love is patient and kind. Love doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love, love bears all things. It believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, we can certainly be patient at times, right? We can be kind at times. We're not always envious or boastful. I hope not. We're not always arrogant or rude. You don't always insist on your own way, do you? You, I think you bear some things and you believe some things and you hope some things and you endure some things. It's not hard to love sometimes, but we're not called to love sometimes. We are called to put on love. It is to be a part of your being. Love certainly can and should involve emotions and affections for each other. And it can and, and, and must actually include actions and attitudes. But let's look back on Colossians 3, verse 12. It says this. 
put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on then as God's chosen holy ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, all these things. Putting on all these righteous attributes is part of putting on love. And putting on love includes putting on all of these things and more, like the passage in 1 Corinthians. All of these things are part of love. Love involves action, but it involves, also involves who you are. So we're, we're not just to act kind and, and put on kindness, not just to act humble and be uh, be humble, but to embody those things. Your identity is to put on love. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. God defines what love is, and we are made in the image of God. We should reflect what God is and his ways. We should be love like God is love. Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, 35. Love is reflecting what God is like. Love is, is part of the identity of the new life in Christ. Just a little uh, earlier in Colossians, it talks about putting on the new self, putting off the old self, putting on the new self. It's part of when you are born again in Christ, you put on love. Because that is part of the identity that we have as Christians. Love is not an additional add-on being a Christian. Love is a must. Now, we're not saved by our love for God or for others. We're saved through grace, by faith. But part of being born again is putting on love, putting on the new self, and that means putting on love. And before we get a little bit more into what love is, let me get into what love is not. Love is not accepting and approving of whatever choices somebody makes. I think our society tends to think of love as just blanket approval, right? But I don't think it's loving to affirm and approve and encourage somebody when they make poor or, or even harmful choices, right? And, you know, the world might object to that and say that if you don't approve of everything they do, and if you don't think that the way that they think, it's not loving. But we have the truth of Scripture of what is good and what is not good. And so how could it be loving to encourage somebody to do what is not good? That's, that's not loving. That seems like you, you should say something. <laughs> or at least not encourage harmful behavior. And it can be difficult to navigate how to love somebody who's making consistent life choices, uh, that, lifestyle choices that are, that are not good, right? Each situation is different. And I think that's one of the reasons that we have uh, a church body, right? We have pastors, we have life group leaders, and we have other mature Christians that can help navigate these things. Because, yeah, it's, it can be difficult to love somebody who... Um, you really disagree with, with what their choices are making. It's not just a personal thing that you disagree, but Scripture says their lifestyle choices are harmful. They're not good. How do you love somebody? It, it can be done. <laughs> um, we can be kind even in the midst of that. We can be loving and humble in the midst of that. Um, so if you have a situation like that and you're not sure what to do, Ask. Ask me. Ask uh, uh, your life group leader. Ask other mature Christians in, uh, in the church. Now, knowing what love is is important for knowing how to love, right? So let's get into what is love. Jesus said, love your neighbors as yourself, right? You're familiar with that. We actually heard it last, uh, last week a bit. It can be loving to, 
to bring dinner to a family that you know, had, is sick or that has had surgery. Um, and many at Crossway do those kinds of things. It's wonderful to, to serve somebody in that way. But what if you thought, right? So if you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, I think, I think if, if somebody came to my house and um, just started cooking for me instead of bringing me a meal and just you know, used all my pots and pans and all those kinds of things and brought the whole family over, I think I would really enjoy that if I just had had surgery. But I think maybe some of you would probably feel imposed upon if that happened, right? You, <laughs> you're recovering from surgery. You kind of want peace and quiet, or maybe you're sick and you don't necessarily want to host uh, a family coming over. Different parts of the world are different in things like that. But people are different in those, those kind of things. So I think when Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, he's not calling you to, you know, just treat each other people exactly, specifically how you want to be treated. He's saying, he's saying, Find out how they wish to be treated. And that takes communication. I think communication is a big part of love. How do we love one another if we don't know anything about each other? You've got to ask questions, be involved in relationships. Certainly, that you can love people who you don't know anything about, but you can love the, the closer you get with somebody, the more you learn about them, the more effective you can be at at loving them. More specific you can be at loving them. And sometimes it takes understanding. Uh, it takes time to understand, uh, especially if there are cu cultural differences. And uh, New England's uh, interesting that way. New Englanders, uh, probably harder to, to love than uh, some other parts of the country. We, you know, we're personal. We, uh, we don't necessarily love to tell you all about our lives. Um, and uh, we can be private, uh, but that's okay. You can find out how to love um, each individual, right? So we've kind of talked all around this. What, what is love? When, we, when the Bible talks about love, there are a few different aspects of it that it highlights. Now, it's, it's more than this, but it's not less than this. So I have three here. A, love is sacrificial. So part of Love is that it's sacrificial. First John 3.16 says, By this we know love that he, Jesus, laid down his life for us. Love isn't just doing what we think is nice for somebody else. It's taking the time to understand what would really be a blessing. Right? And in, in, in this circumstance, right, Jesus coming and, and sacrificing for us, that's not something that we requested, but Jesus knew that we needed. So sometimes it's like that. Love isn't just doing nice things when you, uh, when you want to do nice things either, right? Love involves making sacrifices for the sake of others, uh, inconveniencing yourself at times for the benefit of, of others. So love is sacrificial. B, love involves action. 1 John 3.18 says, Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. Let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You can say, I love you all day, but it's meaningless if you don't show it, right? Love isn't just an emotion or feelings or just words. It takes effort. It takes doing. So, love is sacrificial. Love involves action. And see, love demands obedience to God. Love demands obedience to God. First John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. If you say that you love God and you don't trust him, that what he says is good for you is good, and what he says is bad for you is bad, then that's not actually love. You don't actually love God. You know, if I had a dog and I told you that I love my dog, and you asked me... Um, you know, hey, you must love playing with him. You know, does he have a favorite toy that he loves to, to play with? And, oh, no, I, 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 don't, I don't really like to do that. He gets drool all over it, and it's kind of gross. Well, you, you must like taking him from walks, right? Um, <clears throat> well, he loves going on walks, but I don't, I don't take him. It's kind of tiring, you know? Um, okay, uh, well, you've you got to take care of him and, and feed him. Well, no, I let other people do that. That's kind of a lot of work. <sighs> You must like petting him at least, right? 
no, I don't, I don't like getting fur on my hands and stuff, you know. You must like looking at him or something. No, he's, he's actually kind of ugly. <laughs> right? If, if that was my response, right, you'd rightly think I was nuts. H- how could I love my dog if I want nothing to do with him? Right? It doesn't make sense. How can you love God if you want nothing to do with him? If you don't spend time with him, time reading what he says or listening to what he says or talking to him. How can you love others? How can, how can you love God? How can you love others if you're always putting yourself first? And so what is love? I'm going to boil it down to one short sentence so you can remember. Although it's more than this, it's not less than this. Love is putting God and others before self. When you love someone, when you want to serve them, you look out for their best. And as Jeff said last week, we are to love your neighbor like Jesus loves you. Love is putting God and others before self. So that's the what. How about the why? Why must we love? Number two, why must we love? The first and maybe obvious example, uh, uh, first and most uh, obvious answer is simple. You know, God tells you to love. In his word, we're commanded to love, to love God, to love others. And so we should love. Earlier in this passage, we're told to put to death all these evil and harmful things. In verse 5, you know, we're put to death sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. In verse 8, we're told to put to death anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying. And we're told to put on, verse 12, right? Put on compassionate hearts, Kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. And then ultimately, verse 14, put on love. Above all, put on love. We're told to do it, right? Jesus was asked this question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great And first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Putting on love would be to do exactly this. Love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind. Love others as yourself. Love God, love others, as Mike McLaren will always say. (laughs) Love God, love others. Putting on love. And love of others. It makes us put to death all of these evil things. It makes us put off temptation to sin. Putting on love gives us compassionate hearts. Verse 12. It makes us kind and humble and meek and patient. It helps us bear with one another. It compels us to forgive one another. It makes us like Christ. And if you want to be like Jesus, if you really want to follow Jesus, put on love. And I think the second reason is kind of a reverse or, or look at what the world is like without love. You've seen some of the effects in your own life. You've read about some of the effects of not loving God and not loving others. All that really is wrong with the world is a result of people not loving God and not loving others. It's sin. Sin has stained not just people, but the universe itself. It's, it's part of the curse of sin when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. And looking throughout history, we, we have seen the effects of not loving God and not loving others has quickly led to violence and murder, to, to wars and famine, to homelessness, mental illness, to racism, sexism, oppression, cancer, disease, death, chaos, um, to hate and the most vile and evil things that I want you to describe here. Lack of love has done this. But more personally, even in your own life, in your own sin, right? Your own failure to love God and to love others has resulted in not just you hurting yourself, right? But you hurting other people. 
hurting your family, your parents, your children, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, hurting the world around you. We have added, each of us individually has added to the evil in the world because we don't love God all the time. We don't love others all the time. See, God had a plan in the garden, right? An order of things to eat from any of the trees except for this one tree. One simple and easy rule. Maybe it wasn't that easy, I don't know. But Adam, as our representative, made the choice to disobey. So now sin has entered the whole world and has caused all this evil. And every time you sin, you confirm that you would have made the same choice that Adam and Eve did. So now we're, we're all sinners, right? We don't escape from this. No one escapes from this. The world's broken and corrupted. In the 60s and the 70s, the hippies promoted peace and love and unity. And, you know, there's something to that. Now, I'm not suggesting we all get tie-dyed shirts and sit around the campfire singing kumbaya to increase our love, but we all desire peace, right? Peace in the world, peace amongst our own families. And we know that, you know, fighting and violence isn't good. It doesn't feel good. Having enemies isn't good. We all, you know, we all want to experience love and friendship. Love, biblical love, brings about peace and unity, when we, when we have Christ, when we're united to him, we are united to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're made more and more like him as we're sanctified. We will love God and love others more and more if we have faith in God. Verse 14 says, Above all these put on love. And what does it say after that? Which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Why must we love we must love because it's what unites us and makes us like Christ. It brings about peace and unity. If you want success in your spiritual growth, you must put on love for God and love for others. That's why we have to love. It's the way God has made us. He's made us to love God. He's made us to love others. So now we've asked the what is love and the why must we love? Last point, how can we love? We're sinners. We're born into sin. And uh, we have corrupted natures, right? How, how can we possibly love God and love others? It's an impossible task, certainly to do perfectly. But we're corrupted in our natures. Uh, does that mean that we just shouldn't even try? because we can't do this perfectly. I say there's hope for us, friends, because let's, let's look to Jesus for help. Philippians 2 says this, and it's a little bit longer of a passage, but stay with me here because the, the whole thing here speaks to what we're talking about. Philippians 2 verse 1, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation of the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. See, peace, unity, togetherness. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to the own, their, his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You have this. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Here's, we have to look to Christ. Not just as an example, right? Verse 5 in Philippians says, says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours. You have this. So when we look at what Jesus has done for us, yeah, I, 
he, he left the, the perfection of heaven to come down to earth to be born, to be a frail human being just like us, to live a life exposed to the same temptations that we face, exposed to the sin and the evil that com people committed and the disease and the sickness that's all around us and the corruption that's all around us. He healed them. He loved them. And further, he endured the whips and the beating, the abandonment of his friends for the cross for my sin. Why? Why? Because he loves me. Even in my sin, he loves me. Even in all your sin, he loves you. And you know who I have seen love like Jesus? Moms. I know my mom loves each of her boys, and I can't you begin to guess all the sacrifices that she made over the years for us. I've seen my own wife, Megan, um, care for our kids as a mom, sacrificing time and effort and sleep and patience. And as much as I think I've, well, I, I do, I do sacrifice for my kids, but Megan, all the more so. I love my kids and I do sacrifice for them. But man, she works hard. And at times, even yesterday, we celebrated uh, Mother's Day, because Sunday is hard, <laughs> um, and I'm preaching here. So, <laughs> um, But, you know, Dave set aside for her, but she worked so much yesterday caring for our kids. And even with all my efforts, I still needed her help on a number of these things. And she gave, she gave, and gave of herself. And I'm sure your mom's or your wife is much like this. Um, it's a reflection of Christ. Why, why sacrifice so much? For the love of the children. Right? You can understand that. Um, everybody has a mom. Not perfect, but it's a reflection of, of Christ. Love, you know, the, the feeling of love for kids isn't always there. You know, they can frustrate you. You can get angry. And yet moms continue to sacrifice in the midst of that, to be compassionate, kind, humble, not perfectly, patient with their kids too, not perfectly, forgiving their sins, of, uh, their kids' sins against her. Because love is deeper than a feeling, right? Love is a part of you, something that you become even if it's not perfect. And here's the thing. God, God, Jesus, loves you and loves me even more than the best mom ever loved her kid. And when you love Jesus with all, all your heart, and then, then sacrifice and inconvenience are made so much easier. Sometimes love does take much sacrifice. Sometimes it takes getting your hands dirty. And when you love Jesus with all, your all, then loving comes naturally, right? To a mom, loving kids comes naturally. If Jesus has loved you and forgiven you, how can you not love him? If you see how he has loved you with an everlasting love. He's forgiven the ugliness of your sin. And the evil that you have done and you will do. How can you not love him? How can we not forgive others? Now as if this wasn't enough... He's also given us his spirit. Because we need this. He's given us a new self. And if you have believed, then you already have the mind of Christ. Right? That's what the passage that we read. Verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. You have this because you've been born again. And if you haven't been born again, Repent and believe, and he will put his spirit in you. And you will be able to love. God has called you a task that he has equipped for you for. He has. Let's put on our new self, the new clean clothes, now that we, uh, our spirit has been cleansed by the blood of Christ. 
And if you, if I, if you haven't done that, right, um, today's the day. Here's, here's your opportunity. Give your life to Christ. You can, you can turn, and he will give you a new spirit, one that is full of love. Not perfectly. We're in this together. We're, we're flawed individuals, but he will give you a new heart. And um, you don't have to wait till you've gotten your act together or, to, or until you understand everything. Um, you don't become perfectly loving all of, a, all of a sudden. Or you don't have to become perfect lo- perfectly loving before you give your life to Christ. Because as you submit yourself to God, you'll, he will make you more and more like Christ. And he forgives you all your missteps and your sin, past, present, and future. Right? That's for us too that, that have believed. I can tell you a life lived in devotion and love for, for Christ is what will satisfy you. It gives you more joy than anything else in the world. And we know sanctification, growing in love, it's progressive, right? We don't get there all, all of a sudden, hey, put on love. Oh, yeah, okay, great. I'll go home and do that, and I'll be I'm good to go. <laughs> right? we, we're going to grow in love. And so how can we love? How can we do this? We can love because God has loved us and given us his Holy Spirit. How can we love? We love because God has loved us and given us his Holy Spirit. Though putting on love might be the most difficult thing in the world to do, it's possible because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And that's not the end, right? The Holy Spirit dwells in you, and then you must practice these things. To become a great musician, you must practice. To be a great athlete, you've got to practice. To be a great programmer, you've got to practice. Anything you want to get good at, you must practice. And if you want to grow in love, you've got to practice putting that on. So as Christians, we must not only love God and others, but have a heart of love as we conclude here. And if you love God with all your heart, your soul, your might, sacrifice and inconvenience will come with joy. Not always happiness. Joy is something that's sometimes immaterial. How can you have joy when you're going through what seems like the most difficult thing in the world? Well, you can because Christ is with you. I could say more, but let me pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us with an everlasting love. Christ, you have loved us, Jesus, so much that you came to earth to die for us. Lord, I ask that you would fill us up with love, that we would not just love you, would not just love our family We not just love our people around us in this church, Lord, but that you would fill us so that we are overflowing with love, that we would embody love, that it would be a part of us, that part of our identity would be love, that people would know us, that people would know we're Christians because we love and they haven't seen that kind of love before, Lord, overflow our cups with love, that it would spill out into the world, that we would see Franklin know your love because we are just full of it, full of love for others, full of love for you, Lord. So give us much, Lord, we ask, not for our own sakes, but for the sake of your glorious name, and that you would see others come to know your love. But do give us love. Give us a heart for love. Help us to be forgiving of each other, really and truly. And may you be glorified because of your love spread throughout us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.